Papua New Guinea is an island located directly north of Australia. It's the second largest island in the world, Greenland being the largest island. And what makes it so special is that because it, it's isolated out there in the Pacific, it's kind of the land that time forgot. Of the 5,000 languages that are found on Earth, there's 1,000 found here. And it's one of the great repositories of biodiversity. So if you look at the, the world's remaining rainforests, you've got the Congo, you've got the Amazon, and you've got Papua New Guinea. With six tectonic plates meeting there is some of the newest ground on Earth. So it's got sort of a laboratory of new environments and new species that daily is moving. But when the, the first Westerners got there, they thought it was one single mountain range in the center surrounded by a swamp. And it wasn't until the 1930s that uh, Australian explorers began to get there and, and realize that that wasn't a single mountain range. That was hundreds of mountain ranges, if not thousands, squashed together. And in those valleys were thousands of different cultures, each with their own language as different as Russian is from Spanish. So that that swamp that surrounds this has isolated them and basically kept them out of the mix for hundreds or thousands of years. And when the first Australians got there, these folks had missed World War I. They'd never seen an airplane. They were not working with steel. And it was like going back in time. It's also the repository of all these unique creatures that these people have a relationship with. My goal is to try to figure out how we got where we are and what can we save of the planet. And I'm getting a chance to talk to people who are at square one. Well, when I say Papua New Guinea is biologically diverse, I mean that it, cont it contains unique organisms found only here and, uh, you know, as yet uncounted organisms found only here. For example, the little expedition that I led found 50 new species. And if we'd have taken different uh, scientists, we'd find 50 more. It's the most culturally and biologically diverse place on the earth. Uh, one thing to remember, the island of New Guinea is on the Australian side of what is known as the Wallace Line. So uh, it's an artificial designation that separates placental mammals from marsupials. New Guinea is on the marsupial side. So it's still a land of very few mammals, but lots of reptiles and amphibians and insects. New Guinea, for those of us who like wild places, is iconic. I got to northern Australia. The guy I was traveling with wanted to go to Thailand. I said, I'll go to New Guinea. When I came back to the States, my uh, brother convinced me to go to graduate school. He said, you're wasting your time. You should get out there and try to contribute. I walked into a class. A guy was talking about New Guinea. Like a knucklehead, I raised my hand and said, hey, I just came back from New Guinea. And that's not true. I saw this, that, 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 that. Before I got out of the class, one of the graduate teaching assistants grabbed me and said, hey, there's a professor here that has a grant to go back to New Guinea. And we're looking for somebody who would, could handle it. Do you think you're interested? And then that's just 30 years later, here I am. I work at the headwaters of the Strickland River. It's right in the center of the map, practically, of the country. It's the uh, Strickland is the second largest river system, the fly being, or the third largest river system. So it's dead center on the map. It's very isolated, no roads, no airstrips till the late 90s. When I first went there, considered unexplored and uncontrolled territory. In my mind, conservation is a people problem. That's why anthropologists are vital to solving the conservation problems on the planet. You know, typically they make they turn this over to the biologists who are in love with the birds, bees, and trees, and then they don't understand why the people cut down the trees, shoot the birds, eat the things. You know, they don't quite get it. So I thought by attacking it from a people side, we'd take the most important organism as far as creating a change in conservation in this system and deal with it from that end. And if they solve those problems, we'll solve the conservation problems. I, I find that the acceptance of anthropology as a vital part of a conservation plan has grown. When I started, I was talking to a bunch of biologists and I had to prove to them that I actually knew what was out there. And I understood the latest theories of how we were going to save this, like corridors and island biogeography and that sort of stuff, which I did. But what's happened is, and it's the reason I'm working, is they kept failing. Time after time, they'd get people out there who either couldn't communicate with the locals, didn't want to deal with the locals, or didn't understand why the locals didn't think this was as important as they did. So that's how I got my opening, is that I understood that the locals weren't going to be some super people. They were people, and that I had to meet them on their own terms. Well, I work 
you know, in, in a, what we look at as an isolated wilderness. But in fact, of course, it's the home of a group of people, in, in particular, the group of people called the Hewa. So what Westerners would look at is a, you know, godforsaken, out in the middle of nowhere uh, bunch of trees is actually somebody's home. And these people, even though they don't have the internet and they don't have a, a knowledge of the outside world that we would consider uh, very modern, have for generations been in contact with other people who have been in contact with other people. And in fact, you know, the early currency in Papua New Guinea was were shells, like in many parts of the world. Well, there's no shells in the middle of the country. So they had to be part of trading networks that actually got them from the middle of nowhere to the coast. In order to do that, they had to learn other languages and learn to deal with other cultures. And of course, they successfully did. So while I was going to a place that either in, in the old days, anthropologists would have painted as unique and untouched. And then as that faded away, folks would just paint as primitive and untouched, was in reality a place that was at the center of a trading network from salt from the highlands and bows and all kinds of other things that um, made them kind of, you know, worldly in a sense. Uh, but uh, they, they weren't in touch with modern thoughts about conservation, of course, because they got lots of trees and animals. They didn't see any need to conserve anything. I think that the idea that humans live in balance with nature is, is a romantic cliche that sprang from, you know, when our ancestors got to North America, they saw all this that by European standards was untouched. And they've met people that would share where they weren't real good at sharing. And it's, same, it's just carried over. It's been cultural baggage. And of course, the interesting stuff, right, when you go to, to talk to the people like the Hewa, uh, is, is to come back with something neat and unique so that you can talk about how different they are from us. It's not fun to say, well, you know, they cut trees down like we cut trees down. And the difference is they can't sell them. So they don't cut a lot of them down because it's a lot of work. Their cultures are intimately tied to birds. Right. Birds are adornment. Birds are food. Birds are the uh, harbingers of, of fruited and flowering trees, all things that they need to survive. So any young man who really wants to make an impression on his elders and the ladies is going to know how to get bird feathers, bird meat, bird eggs, and knows to find the flowering and fruiting trees that they can lead you to. Birds of paradise are important to uh, everybody there as, as decoration, and cultural symbols. And there are several legends wherein the birds of paradise call people to new fertile ground. Uh, and of course, these birds of paradise uh, eat some of the plants that are can be eaten by humans. And they also uh, partake of a pandanus and, and other things that humans can eat. So there are legends like that where the people hear the call of the bird and they go create a new house. I was able to take traditional knowledge and turn it into a conservation initiative by asking the local guys to perform experiments that had been had already been vetted by uh, conservationists. There's a fellow named Bruce Beeler who wrote the one of the authors of the Birds of New Guinea. And Bruce had done bird sightings all over the world and, and, and taken samples and trying to, you know, try to figure out what was where. So I took a couple of his papers and I redid them, but I redid them with myself and the locals who were teaching me about the birds. I sat down with them and recorded every bird that was there, where, what habitat they would be found in, what they ate. Birds in New Guinea are segregated not only by habitat, but by altitude. So we went from 500 meters above sea level to 2,000 meters above sea level. We set up stations every 50 meters and we sat down and we listened. I think it was three minutes for the birds. I recorded every call that the locals identified. And we did this for months. The guys would say, look, you're not going to find this bird at this altitude or in this environment. Well, to make sure that they weren't trying to make me happy, we went over the environments and just did it sort of a blind test. Didn't ask them why, what, where, just what are you hearing? What are you hearing? And of course, I got better and better at this. And uh, over the months, of course, what they told me was backed up by the data. They said, yeah, we didn't have, we didn't find these birds at this altitude. Then I took that data, and that was my, my dissertation, and I published it. And I sent it to Beeler, and I sent it to a fellow named Jared Diamond to look at my, my bird tables and tell me, you know, was I missing something? Because 
my biggest fear is not that I wouldn't get the doctorate, was that I'd get the doctorate and wouldn't be able to do anything with it because I had done a BS study that made all the people that see them as wonderful naturalists living in harmony and all that stuff happy. I wanted to conserve these places. I wasn't so worried about the job. I wanted to do something with it. So I really, if, if Diamond had come back and Beeler had come back and said, man, this is garbage, you missed A, B, C, D, and E, well, I either had to start over or get my carpenter's belt back on. Luckily for me, it, it worked out. I created something called the Papuan Forest Stewards because I knew that we wanted, we had to make the next step from theory to actually doing something, right? And in order to do something, this had to meet not only the needs of conservationists, but the locals. What I needed to do was create something that would solve their financial problems and also solve the conservation problem. Because in my mind, right, we were asking these guys to take a deed restriction on their property. They were going to be able to live their lives, but within reason, within bounds. They couldn't sell the trees off. They couldn't totally cut the cassowaries off in their migrations. They had to, you know, they had to think about it. In order to think about it, I wanted to make sure they were compensated. I also wanted this knowledge to not get lost in the intergenerational wash that happens when money starts to show up and there are other things to do. Um, we found in other, you know, societies that once traditional teachers are lost and people start to migrate to the town or they start to hang out with the missionary, it only takes a generation and this kind of knowledge can be lost. So I wanted to create a financial incentive for the folks to conserve their land and conserve their knowledge and a way to pass it on. So I created the Papua and Forest Stewards and in order to do that though, so it wasn't a nepotism project, which is a big problem in, a lot, in New Guinea, I created a test. And in order to pass and become a Papuan Fort Steward, you have to identify the 180 birds that are found if you're in the Hewa there. If you're at the Kajende Highlands, which is another project I have going, you have to identify 120 birds. That's part one. If you pass that, you then have to give me, uh, I give you a random sampling of about 20 trees of the 300 that you have to be able to identify. From them, I want to know what pollinates them, what visits the fruit while it's on the tree, and what eats the fruit when it hits the ground. Only those that can identify all these things to my satisfaction become stewards. And those stewards then are paid to travel their clan boundaries to make sure, and to make sure no one cuts a garden on the clan boundaries. Nobody puts a snare or hunts on the clan boundaries. And to look for the signs of uh, birds on these things are most important bird culturally is the cassowary. So we look for cassowary tracks and cassowary food uh, stuffs, and they record this via timestamp photo to prove they've been out and they're paid for it. They also have to apprentice a young person to themselves. It could be a male or a female. That kid is gonna to have to take a test for me akin to what their parents have taken. Of course, it's over five years. They have a five-year apprenticeship, then they take a test, and if they have it, they get another five years, and then they begin to receive pay. So it's, um, you know, it's a cultural conservation project built around biodiversity and tree conservation that solves the financial problems of people. And when I first went there, there was no airstrip. And so I went to the place where there's now a station and an airstrip, and I could see cassowary tracks down there. And the old fellows that had taught me this were still alive. So we knew that by putting this strip in that the locals wanted, because it gave them contact with the outside world, chance to get medicine and that sort of thing, they had cut off the corridors that the the animals used to migrate from side to side in the valley and from elevation to elevation to find the fruiting and flowering trees. So in, we wanted to undo that. The only way, we couldn't undo that en masse. We didn't want to get rid of the airstrip. But each clan boundary is typically a creek. So we agreed that the best way to um, create a conservation corridor, which we called the road of the cassowary, was to take these clan boundaries and to limit what was done there. If there were gardens, let them grow back. We wouldn't cut new gardens. We wouldn't hunt and snare in them. And in that way, the cassowaries would have free reign in those spots. Now, they're being paid to allow the cassowary to have free reign. 
So over the years, we've found that um, we're beginning to see cassowary tracks at 700 meters in elevation again, whereas when we started, we weren't seeing them. They were only found at higher elevations. So we're creating, you know, using an internationally accepted conservation concept in local terms. Well, we understand it's going to be dynamic, right? In between these boundaries, people are going to be cutting gardens, moving around and leaving things uh, fallow and moving on to another area. We, we get all that, but we're trying to do our best to string habitats together. The Explorers Club gave me my initial grants. The National Geographic helped me. The Bishop Museum helped me for a while. Conservation International gave me some money. But when we really start to take this um, to the, the level it's at now, the Barrick Corporation, it's a Canadian-based mining firm, and it pour, their local thing is Porgora Joint Venture, uh, has invested heavily in the project. For the last, um, yeah, 15 years, they've been, they've been the primary sponsor. And they've allowed me to go from having a, a three teachers who helped me create my dissertation and the books and all that stuff to 160 people working for me now and 100 women, 160 men, 100 women that are part of this conservation initiative in the Valley. I think there's several benefits to uh, Barrick uh, for this. First, it's uh, their, their sediment from their mine flows into the Lagaipe River system, which is runs right through the Haywood territory. So they affect the Haywood people and they meet regularly with them to test the water to make sure that it, it meets, you know, the environmental standards that they've set for themselves. Secondly, it's it's good PR, right, for local people. When when the locals want the mine, they don't realize, like none of us realize, the changes that are going to happen when you bring a mine in. And they see all their they value their nature, you know, they they like their outdoorsmen. They like birds and this sort of stuff, but they want to take care of themselves and their kids and their families. So when you come in with an alternative that says, hey, um, we can help you do this, they're receptive. In the case of Barrick and the Haywa, which are very downstream from them, this was a way of extending aid and a different sort of aid that wasn't trying to um, sort of devalue the culture. The way we do it, the Papuan Four Stewards, we take culture and make it an asset. It's the most valuable thing they've got now. Instead of, oh, geez, now they've got to learn to do all this stuff and they got to do it in English because nobody wants Hewa. I want Hewa. I want tradition. They're smarter. When we went out there to find 50 new species, they led the way. They weren't new species to them. They were new species to us. So, you know, when it comes, I defer to them constantly and refer to them as my teachers when we deal with government or anybody else. But... For me, I'm the, the interface for them between a mining company, the government, conservation people, because I understand both and they trust me, you know, because for 30 years I've been doing nothing but trying to help them. So the reason I, here's where, where I see future financing coming from, because, you know, like all extractive industries, a mine has a certain life. Um, when I initially was attracted to this project and the reason Conservation International and Bruce Beeler and I hooked up is that I wrote a paper that said all these traditional societies and these lands should be funded through carbon sequestration money. REDD Plus is a international program for the, the REDD stands for Reduction in Emissions from Forest Destruct Deforestation and Forest Degradation. The plus designates it as a plus biodiversity. So there, you know, we don't just want forest plantations. We want functioning ecosystems. And that's what Red Plus is designed to save. My, one of my, my things now is this thing I'm pushing called development without infrastructure, right? If you look at Papua New Guinea and you look at the, the daunting task it is for any government or agency to try to bring Western style development to these folks, you you know, it, it's it's awe-inspiring that anybody tries to do anything. With six tectonic plates going there, for example, everybody wants a road. But the ground's constantly moving. So you build this road into this unbelievably remote area and undo the biodiversity and the cultural diversity that's there, only to have the road shaken apart daily and eventually become so potholed nobody can use it. If you're the government, right, this isn't, some, bag, you know, Bill walks out with a bag of money and distributes it, this money will be handed out electronically. People have to register to get it. They'll have to have bank accounts. 
then, as we know as uh, citizens of the first world, there are no secrets. So we know the money hasn't been absconded with by some third party who can speak English but and just hands out trinkets to the locals. In addition, the government can then tax it by, by certifying the program and backing it up with laws so that the folks that bought these carbon credits have some assurance that it's not just a, a shell game. They can then begin to tax it. And so, you know, if they take their percentage, they've created a form of revenue now that they only have with the few businesses and the extractive industries that are there. So rather than build schools build and, and build all the infrastructure that the local folks have no tax dollars to support, give them a source of income and then let them decide, petition their local um, government agencies for, okay, we want a school. And you can see that here's the, where the money came from in our tax receipts. And then everybody, you know, like I'm fond of telling the local guys because there's no pejorative about calling somebody white or black there. You know, there's no, so I'm a white guy and people refer to me as the white guy. And I said, if you're going to take white guys' money, you're going to play by white guys' rules, right? And that means accountability, transparency, all these things that aren't impossible to do, especially with electronics. We can do this. And when I, I'm saying, I'm making the same pitch to the government officials is don't fall into the same trap. You'll spend millions to build a road to nowhere. If you take that same million dollars, take 20% off the top for government and hand the rest to the locals, they will get their kids to schools. They will take that money and better their lives. It's, it's a hard sell because folks see those big dollars that come with, you know, agencies and the, all the agencies for development are still behind them. They want to they wanna build stuff, of course, because we build it. But I think this is the future. And I think, you know, our latest problems uh, g give us a road forward because we know we need nature more than ever now. These are people and they're like any other group of people. When you come to them and you have a proposition and you say, you know what you ought to be doing? There's not, I have never met a person on earth that wants to hear what they should be doing. Sure. But if you come to them and say, you know, you showed me how to fish and you showed me, you taught me about this environment. And I really appreciate it. And I, you know, I always made it a point to pay the guys because that way I could demand their time. And I, I don't want to be the bad guest. It's like, oh, here comes the white guy again. He's never going to shut up. You know, instead, oh man, he's coming. Great. There's a chance to make some cash. Um, and I could demand their time. So when I said to them, look, I've come up with bigger money now, and I'd like to take this project to the next level. Are you interested? It, and, and, and brought them to the table with a, a seat as an equal. They were, they were there. And then when I said to Greg Walker and said, look, um, here's my feeling, Greg. If we give these guys money, just like if we give Australians money, some guys are going to drink it. Some guys are going to throw it away on fast women. Other guys are going to send their kids to school. He's a regular guy, but he's a good guy. He's got good intentions and a good heart. He's trying to take care of his family. If we can help him do that, he'll make good choices. Instead of us getting involved in, well, you know, we, and I always say to kids when I'm talking to them here, look, if someone built me a million dollar house, I would take it. But I can't keep it up. I'm a school teacher. It's the same for these folks. They know how to build. They know how to do a lot of things. So you walk in and you build them this fancy school with windows and all stuff that they can't keep up and come back 10 years later and go, man, you ungrateful bastards. My God, I went through all this to get this for you. Well, they didn't ask you for it. They'll take it if you give it to them. They'll take anything. But, you know, I can't keep it up. Does it look like I can do wax floors here? You know, I want to bring them into the world at their pace. And if we give them, money to do it, they'll make decisions. Some of them will be bad. I make bad decisions, but most of them will be pretty good. And in aggregate, we're talking about a lifetime here. You know, we're talking about saving these forests forever, not for five years. And we're going to be onto another five-year plan doing something else. So um, I think, you know, when you give them money, let them make little decisions along the way, you can see how things are going. And that's where, you know, that's the, the people that have bought into that are people with long experience in trying to do development. The guys with an agenda that gets them paid by handing money up and out, they're not interested in this because there's no big contractors involved. But if people are interested in effective work here, it sounds like common sense to people who have driven cabs and tended bar and actually make a living, but it got lost in academia. And so I think um, uh, as an academic, I have the credentials to bring it back and, and you know, really 
try to push it. When I, I wrote this paper that, that suggested that they had value standing up and that the world has developed that value now, it's not just the highest and best use is agriculture or lumber. There's carbon sequestration and biodiversity now that we can put a real value on. Now's the time. Um, it, yet again, it doesn't suit everybody, and not everything can be done that way, obviously. We, I use metals, and I use wood, too, you know. But um, it's, it's one of those things where once you, once you realize that there's a value out there to this and that we're failing, and if you are on the ground, you're watching the failures, um, it's, it's time to try something different. And A hasn't been working. So this guy's talking about Z. And if you know what's out there, you know, I'm not doing anybody any harm. In our project, you know, nobody loses their land. They're still in charge. They don't lose their culture, their language, their land. All that is sacred. And if they want to punt it, it's up to them. But I'm not asking them to. I'm asking them to, you know, teach me. I'm, I'm the student. What I can tell you is that the relationship between traditional society and biological diversity is this. Biological diversity is not the product of balance, but the product of small-scale disturbances, things that are so small that we wouldn't recognize them at first. But if you look at human gardening as a source of disturbance, and you think of the forest as sort of a checkerboard, once if it were all covered in green, it would be the most biologically you know, diverse ecosystem on the planet is the tropical rainforest. But when you drop a couple thousand people in something the size of the U.S. state of Massachusetts, and they start to, with stone axes, cut gardens that are about the size of, uh, you know, half of a football field. And then they allow them to grow back over the years and recut them. And their population stays relatively the same because of tropical diseases, lack of sanitation and medicine. You're actually creating more environments in this rainforest and increasing its diversity. Because now not only do you have this huge swath of 50-year-old forest, but you have the, gra the new gardens, the grasslands, and the forest progression that comes with the regrowth of these gardens. And all the creatures that inhabit them at every step of the regrowth. So you have the primary forest stuff, the 25-year-old the forest stuff, the 20-year-old forest, all the way down to the garden that has certain birds that will visit it. So by keeping this disturbance small, you've increased the diversity. However, the garden isn't as diverse as the primary forest. And if you turn it all into gardens or parking lots, of course, you wipe out the diversity. And you may, when it's gardens, it's all more usable to humans, but it's much less diverse and it's much less usable to the planet as an ecosystem. It's no longer a source of fresh water. It's no longer a source of pollinators. And it's no longer a source of carbon sequestration and fresh air. It's just a source of bananas and potatoes now. So as long as that's, that disturbance is small scale, it's actually, when you go to these societies, you go, wow, look at the diversity around here they live with. But if you put them on the train that we're on, we simplify the environment, and we really, really struggle to save enough of it to save any of the diversity that we depend on.